Hello everyone and welcome to Our Town. My name is Jill Hindley Lawrence and today we are going to have a great conversation with a very special guest, Kevin Calcutt. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Jill. Great to be here. Great. Thanks for being here. Great to have you. Um, Kevin is a candidate for state representative in the 9th Norfolk District. Um, we are just eight days or one week from the election on November 5th. So please remember to get out and vote. Vote early or vote on election day. Um, but we would, we're really happy and um, you know, excited to have a chance today to converse with Kevin casually and, and hear about him as a person as well as as a candidate. So at that, let's get right at it, right, get right to it. Okay, yeah, so welcome. Um, and this, in our town, we like having a, um, a co like having conversations with people local that are making a difference in the community and are, you know, people that we want to get to know. So, Kevin, would you give us, please, like a little bit about who you are and how long you've been in town, in Norfolk and in, in the district? Um, we'd love to hear that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, Jill, thank you so much for doing this. The service that you provided the community to be able to get this information out there is invaluable, especially in these days and times. So thank yeah. you so much for doing that. Also, thank you to Rentham Cable 8 for having us in their studio today. Yeah. This is the first time I've been here. It's very uh, yeah. cool. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, great. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> um, so about me. Um, I have an interesting background, actually. Um, when I was in high school, I was working in pizza parlors and restaurants, mm -hmm. and that really sparked my interest and passion for the hospitality and cooking industry. Okay. Cool. So I went to school at Johnson & Wales in Providence, oh, right. and I went to go get my cooking degree so I could go out there and start my culinary lifestyle. Yeah. About halfway through, I realized that probably wasn't the professional path I was meant to do. Okay. Uh, I still love cooking. Probably yes. the only reason why my wife Erica is with I know. me. I know. And are you the main? Are oh, you the main absolutely, cook? Oh, wow. absolutely. Okay. That is my domain, and I enjoy it. And I think that she enjoys it as well. To tell you the truth. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I transitioned into a role where I was managing hospitality operations, um, and so from there, I started working in some of the largest hotels and actually downtown Chicago is where oh, we went wow. after that. Um, okay. And it was a great experience and it helped to develop this, what we call a servant's heart. And what it really impacts is your approach to every engagement, every interaction and being in service to others and the importance of being able to do that effectively so people feel heard, they feel listened to and they feel like you're taking actions upon those feedback, that feedback you're getting. Right, I see. After that, from Chicago, we found our way back to New England, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to be closer to our families. We were starting our own family with our young ones. And uh, yeah, we moved to Norfolk about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, so we're in Norfolk now. Obviously, we have our three boys, a 12, mm -hmm. a 9, and a 7-year-old, Colin, Ryan, and Owen. Yeah. And we absolutely love the community. Yeah. And so when we moved to the community, you know, we were so excited to have our first house and yeah. property and yeah. ability to be able to do things around there. But what we also heard was that there was concerns about, you know, some open space behind us eventually being developed without any kind of restriction. Um, and that caused us some concern because now this big investment we just made could mm -hmm. be impacted by something out of our control. Right. So I took that and for the first time I ran for a role in town for the planning board to be able to get more insight to what the long-term planning initiatives were for the community. Okay. Um, it didn't take me very long to realize that those discussions do not happen at the planning board level. While right. it was a great foundation of experience for how site plan reviews work, about how local zoning bylaws are applied, and about the different projects that are coming through those avenues. Yeah. I needed to get to a place where I was able to impact some of that vision. So I ran for the select board a year after that on a platform of transparency and inclusion with the community to make sure everybody was informed about what was going on and had a say in what was going on. Yeah. And I won. Yeah. That's right. um, and so I spent my first term on the select board really focused on being able to get some of those longstanding opportunities taken care of. We increased engagement by redoing our budget process that made it more inclusive for people to have input. Mm -hmm. We started doing more communication initiatives where we were doing cable shows and doing yeah. newsletters and doing outreach and office hours. An hour. I remember the hours yep. yeah, that you could go in. That was great. Yeah. And then, you know, we also started to put forward this emphasis on engagement, letting people ask questions in the context of meetings, getting people to understand some of these processes that were kind of convoluted mm -hmm. um, so that they could understand more about what's building towards the community that they're all a part of. Mm -hmm. um, I was reelected to a second term. At that point, I had been chair for two years in a row mm -hmm. through COVID, which right. was an experience unlike any other. Yep. <laughs> um, and then was reelected to the board and spent another year as chair actually in 2024. So I've had a great foundation of local experience 
And then to layer on top of that, I was also appointed as Norfolk's representative on the Norfolk County Advisory Board for three years now. Okay. I was Norfolk's representative on the MBTA Advisory Board, where I was also on the Commuter Rail Subcommittee. Uh -huh. I was on the Master Plan Committee, the Rezoning for Town Center Committee. I've had my hand in just about everything yeah. I can to help build a local perspective and an understanding for where we are and how we get there. Mm -hmm. um, now I want to try to transition that success that we've had locally, that impact that we've had locally, into our representation up on Beacon Hill. There are so many things that you can do locally to be able to impact the direction of your community and support them. Yeah. But at one point, there isn't really too much more you can do without the support of people up on Beacon Hill right. and at the federal level to help you. Right. And so now I want to be that resource for our community so that I can continue that level of service and that impact that we've been able to have up until this point. Okay. Well, that's really great. Okay. Well, it's, you know, you have, you've, it's interesting that you moved in and then within a year or so you said, I want to be involved and you want to be involved in that way where Absolutely. you are in become a decision maker or in at least and also, like you said, transparency so that people understand. Yeah, I think that's that's um, really important. OK, thank you for that a little bit of background. Um, so so before we go into issues or mm -hmm. hot topics. <laughs> um, I'm just, I was thinking about, you know, what I wanted to know or what I wanted to ask you. Um, I just, I'm a people person. So I would love to know first two questions. First is what, aside from public service, and like you said, the servant's heart, um, and aside from family, because, you know, obviously family is at, always at the top, but um, what drives you? What is what are your passions, um, you know, overall, you know, like what are your passions uh, that are other things outside of outside of the community service? Well, I'll admit that community service has taken up a lot of the bandwidth <laughs> as of late. So, so that's pretty much the biggest part. Ooh, yeah. But looking at the things that I, I do enjoy outside of that. Cooking will always okay. be a passion for yeah. me, right? I, I truly loved it. I just couldn't imagine doing it as a profession, right. especially after Everything. seeing how some of the lifelong chef instructors looked yeah, <laughs> after doing it for an like, entire career. So I give all the yeah. credit in the world to those who are able to do it. Uh, yeah. But I, I do enjoy cooking at home. I do try to be creative with what we're doing for the kids. Sometimes yeah. they're on board, sometimes yeah. they're on give not. Us, give us like, what's your favorite dish or what's one of the favorites? So I will say dish? that I did transition during COVID into my COVID hobby being smoking uh, meat barbecue. Uh, I mean, it was a big thing yeah, for us. We yeah. got a big smoker and mm -hmm. once a week we were trying to do different things with brisket and with ribs and with oh, pulled wow. pork. Yeah. Doctor was not thrilled about it, um, yeah. and luckily we weren't going to get cholesterol tests during that no, time. No, there's no right. There's but one no of the fun things we did to get the kids involved in it too was we actually made a YouTube channel where we oh, were going did? through it with getting them involved and uh, what we were doing, and obviously it was more of what we were doing wrong than what we were doing right. right. But it was oh, really fun. fun to get them engaged in it too to see yeah. what goes into these things, not just what the final product is. Right. Oh, right. The process. Yeah, yeah well, that's so, really cool. Even up until today, like we love still hitting the smoker during yeah. Thanksgiving last year. We smoked turkeys and brought them to the police station and the oh, fire station so they got to yeah. share oh, and that's a treat that it's a smoked turkey yep. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, we love to bring over brisket and pulled pork to gilly's house um yeah. to be able to donate to the guys that are living there and support their efforts yeah. and it's really all about just sharing and getting people yeah. involved i mean yeah. when you're smoking meats it's enough for a lot of people so <laughs> right. they're, you're kind of forced to share right but that's been a really cool thing to be able to do not only with you know our family but also our neighborhood and our community yeah it does bring people full food brings people together absolutely yeah, right. right i think about you Anthony Bourdain, who's one of my favorite uh, yes. people to watch. Uh, well, that's really cool. And COVID did give us, with all my grumbling <laughs> about that period of time, it did give us that chance to look inward in terms of like within your house, you know, yeah. and, and that was a you know, kind of a silver lining, I guess. My daughter at the time was about what 14, and she made homemade pasta from like, I wouldn't have even known what to do. I'm like, what are you going to make it from? Flour? Oh, that's <laughs> and water? amazing, yeah. Yeah, she made homemade <laughs> pasta. It was good. You know, it was okay for her first time. Yeah. So, yes. Okay, so good to know that. So, cooking. So, you are you are the chef of the house. Mm. Oh, that must be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then one other personal question, if I may. Sure. Um, so, you're at this place of, in life where your kids are busy in school and you're, and obviously you're, working but also you know and also running for this um position state rep position what do you where do you see yourself in say 10 years you know what do you see like when you look ahead where do you want to be 
That's Down an interesting around. question because <laughs> I can tell you right now that if you were to ask me this 10 years ago, yeah. I never would have been able to tell you that this was that the path I was going to take. Yeah. Because right? you I were just moving back here. That's right. Yeah. And, and I was loving my career. In hospitality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had transitioned from working in operations and hospitality to working in corporate offices and more okay. of an analytical role. Mm -hmm. And then I actually shifted into a more IT centered role where I was working for a company that offers a software solution for restaurants. Oh, okay. So instead, okay, now I'm a client yeah. success, success manager who's focused mo mainly on relationship management, which again, okay. great segue into public yeah. service. Right, it is. Um, but at that point, like I was looking at growing in that career, growing yeah. in my industry. I love the restaurant industry and everything that I want to do is about supporting people that have to go through what I went through managing operations when there wasn't necessarily all these fantastic tools out there to help you do your job more effectively. I see. Yeah, because now there's a lot more. Now there are so many software. support tools out there. <clears throat> um, but that being said, you know, I ran for planning board. I had never envisioned running for public office before. But when I ran for planning board and saw the impact that somebody could have just by reaching out to somebody who's having a problem with an issue or is having a, uh, an application for a special permit that's not finding its way through or yeah. is running into a roadblock with being able to get a disagreement with a neighbor figured out. Right. Sure. Being able to have a positive impact is what truly inspired me at that point. Yeah. And so I just tried to grow that with each new role I took on on the select board, bringing people in to ask questions, educate the community on some of the processes associated to budgeting and expenses and uh, borrowing and all those types of things. Um, it's what continued to drive me. And so with each new role and each new position I take, I find a new interest and a new passion in being able to deliver that kind of representation for the community that trusts you to do it. So right now, I'm looking to do that up on Beacon Hill. I'm yeah. looking to be that voice that can assist people with some of the distinct issues they've talked to us about. I know we're going to get into them in a second, yeah. but you know, local funding for our schools and our towns, yeah. mental health support for our kids and our seniors. Right. Um, early education and childcare costs, like these are all things that people have identified as being impactful items of their day to day lives at, their, at this local level. And yeah. I want to be able to go out there and be able to get them as much support as possible. OK, cool. So that's where you see the next 10 years taking you. Absolutely. Yeah. And really, in, in, you know, as we go through, uh, I think this, this stage, at least for me, um, it's engagement engagement is everything really right no matter how you do it engagement yes. really is um and then the idea of putting out <clears throat> positivity uh I, i'm at this point because i had lost my dad a couple of years ago and i i sometimes now look at you know what is what is a life you know what is it, it, that sort of big picture and like what what are we what are we going to how are we going to leave our you know what, are, what our legacy and and yeah. that positivity positivity alone is a great legacy right i will say too yeah. you know as much as i truly love the hospitality industry the position mm -hmm. i'm in now and the service i'm able to provide operators in all different segments yeah. of hospitality i'm going to step away from that yeah. to be on and take this role this okay. role that you're taking on it is a full-time position you ask anybody who serves they will tell you it's a 60 hour a week job mm -hmm. if you want to do it right and you want to do it effectively mm -hmm. you have to have the dedication the commitment to be able to do it so i'm actually going to be stepping away okay. from my career to be able to take on this position as of january 1st so as much as i truly love yeah. <laughs> what yeah. i'm doing and what i've been working on for the last 25 years um, I'm ready to leave that aside for the time being to be able to dedicate myself to being able to deliver those things to the community. Okay, thanks for, thanks for that. Um, okay, so good. Uh, it was nice to you know hear a little bit more about you um, as a as a human being. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so moving into the candidate Calcutt. Um, so I thought maybe we'd start with when you had already mentioned like the idea of the state aid, state funding, um, state funding, and whether that's you want to talk about schools or town the town towns in general um take it away how are, yeah well like, you know that's that is a topic that comes up a lot with when you um talk to voters oh right. my gosh yes number one issue by <laughs> far and large you know when we're on the doors talking to people across the district it's always a question about how do we get more how do we get more for our schools for our towns for mm -hmm. our public services um and it's a difficult thing because <laughs> when you think about what towns and cities in our commonwealth get the most funding our suburban smaller towns are usually on the outside looking in. Right. Um, and nobody knows that better than those who are working on budgets year in and year out. As a member of the select board, you're charged with bringing a balanced budget to town meeting every single year. Yeah. And you are so heavily dependent on what's going to be coming down the pike in terms of support from the state mm -hmm. to be able to do that. If it's not there or if it's lacking or if it's not growing to meet the rising costs, 
then you have to be able to make the decision to make cuts at the local level. And it's an impossible decision every time yeah, when you have to decide so between a yeah. teacher, a firefighter, a police officer to be able to make your budgets work. It is absolutely heart wrenching and the most difficult part of the job by mm -hmm. far. That being said, I look forward to bringing a foundation in local experience about how we've had to be able to adjust to be able to make those changes to make these annual budgets work up to Beacon Hill and have them be part of that conversation about how we allocate funding. If you look back on previous cycles, you'll see um, back in the last budget, for instance, the governor's budget only included a $30 per student increase as part of the budget for Chapter 7. And that was across the state? That was across that was the state. dollars okay. Now, luckily, the House budget came back with a $100 increase per student, okay. which was more appropriate, still not enough by any means, but more appropriate. Having people who understand what the impact of $30 versus $100 is at the local level is an invaluable perspective to have as part of those conversations. So I truly look forward to being able to bring that perspective to advocate most effectively for our communities during the course of those discussions. And the last thing that I'll add to that is, you know, one of the biggest impacts we've seen when talking to school committees and select boards across the district is the increased cost for special education funding. Um, in the last budget cycle before this one, it went up about 14.1%. Um, and that was absolutely killer for some of our towns. There are towns right now even Millis and Franklin, who are having to go for operational overrides wow. for their school budgets that aren't passing just because people are feeling squeezed right now and they can't accommodate for some of these investments. And they need to be made because we cannot sacrifice the education of our kids in hopes of being able to bridge budgets moving forward. So one of the big things I want to advocate for on top of local funding, town funding, is to be able to reform some of the processes for special education reimbursements to ensure that towns don't have to Put an impossible decision in front of voters any, any longer right okay that's good i know it's it is such a tight the squeeze like you said the squeeze it's i can't the school committee i can't imagine being a superintendent or that would be difficult <laughs> to manage so okay well thank you for that's great um to hear sort of that whole the whole perspective as a um advocating for you know our towns out here you know and and thirty dollars per student oh my goodness <laughs> but that did increase so that yeah. happened okay um all right so moving to another issue another um hot topic as we can call it um over you know, recently at the beginning of the summer we had the uh, the town of norfolk and, and of course impacting the community beyond just the town of norfolk and impacting the district um, was the right to shelter law and the kind of decision that you know kind of came out of you know kind of came out really out of the blue in a way right that they were going to use the base state facility um for immigrants for legal immigrants <laughs> um, and so that was caused a lot of stress and a lot of pressure on our town on Nor the town of Norfolk and the schools and then it's kind of everything kind of halted right and so I I mean I'm up to date I think on that but I know it's something that you get asked a lot by voters so um, what can you tell us where we are now and and how how is the ba you know where is that Bay State facility where are we at what should we know? Sure. So, you know, I'll start at the beginning, right? Um, I had actually just left the select board. We had the election in May. That's right. I had just left the board and three days later, oh the announcement right. came down identifying that this is what Norfolk was going to pre be preparing for. Right. As much as I may disagree with the way that it was disclosed and announced to the community, I felt a responsibility. I had been at the forefront of this stuff for seven years right. here in town. And then three yeah. days There's after chair and, what's yeah. perceivably the biggest thing yeah. to impact the town comes down the pike, yeah. I felt like there was something that I needed to do. So that weekend when it was announced, there wasn't a whole lot of information out there. It was released to the community without any backing of foundation of what was coming next or any kind of backup. Um, so I started leveraging my connections. I started reaching out to anybody I could at the state level to be able to provide us some perspective to help balance what had already put, put out there for the community and to ease mm. some of the tension that you just identified. Mm. Luckily, I was able to be put in contact with a couple of individuals who were able to give me some more context to be able to provide some more information about what to expect, at least in the short term. And I conveyed that out to the community in the ways that I felt I could, you know, whether it be social media or one-on-one -on -one conversations at soccer games, whatever the case may be. Um, from that point forward, it seemed like there needed to be more coordination. I give all the credit in the world to our select board, our school committee, our school mm -hmm. administration, and our town administrator for the job that they did to be able to try to balance what was an almost impossible situation. Having no information out there for something that was going to be okay. as transformationally yeah. impactful to the community. 
Yeah. Um, the, what they managed through was incredibly difficult. But away from what was, was being done at the work, time level, a lot oh of hard gosh. work came from on the schools and all the preparation there. It was unbelievable, and they did an incredible job. But I'll tell you that a lot of my focus at that point shifted from supporting the select board and the community at the town level, and more of engaging with people, residents, oh, okay. and talking to them about their concerns. There was so okay. many people who were legitimately concerned about some of the logistics about how we were going to make this work. Yeah. The idea of um, upwards of 100 kids coming into the Norfolk schools when we were already yeah, having max. to bring yeah. forward a right. proposal for an expansion right. uh, was incredibly distressing. Yeah. Um, and, pl so and plus, the, the f I mean, of course, also the fire, you know, the, the idea of our services as well, right? It was kind of a couple prongs that were You're absolutely right. creating yeah. tension. Um, and so you know, I actually took the approach of finding individuals who may have shared oppositional perspectives but for whatever reason, whether mm -hmm. it be fundamental difference of opinion on immigration mm -hmm. policy in the country as a whole, mm -hmm. or whether it just be focused on the local impacts. Mm -hmm. I met with them. Mm -hmm. I reached out to them. I set up coffee times and I set up lunch dates and all these types of things so that we could discuss their concerns. I could help provide whatever context or background I had to assist them with understanding some of the gaps that existed and then try to identify an aligned path forward. What are the big things that we need to address? If we could pick out two big things that we really get accommodated for, what are they? And I think that was very effective in being able to align a community that was incredibly divided at this point onto an aligned path forward about how we could work together to be able to make this a workable situation. By no means am I saying that it was perfect. And obviously there was a lot of things we still have to work out. But as it stands today, yeah. between the accommodations that was made by the administration, when as it pertained to having an ambulance on site to be able to assist with okay. emergency services so that we weren't impacted. And that's still the case. Still the currently. case. Currently, okay. Um, whether it be the accommodations that were made by DESI um, to be able to help us yeah. with bridging any. I mean, different, different setup, but it's, wow. Um, Okay, I had a follow up. Oh, well, just I think that um, the fact that child care workers don't, they're, they're, it's not like they're being paid uh, a salary, like, a, a, you know, a salary that see, like is outrageous, right? It's not, a, I mean, I know, I mean, I was a teacher way, way back. Um, so, but child care workers are, are not making, it's not, that's not where the money's going. <laughs> where, you know, I guess, I don't know. I don't know why Massachusetts would have the second highest in, in the country, but. I would like to know. Well, there, there's two yeah. reasons, right? Yeah. So one is the limited space. When providers right. don't feel the ability to be able to expand their operation um, or to be able to hire more people, yeah. we're limited. And yeah. so then you get into a supply and demand, demand. situation yeah. where costs are being driven up just because right. they have to make their operations and their businesses work. Mm -hmm. And the second one is making it attractive to people who want to go into that field. We have mm. so many incredibly talented people. I'm sure everybody can remember back to yeah. one super impactful individual yeah. that helped them with their kids as they were growing right. up or as part of the daycare or whatnot. Yeah, or even just an elementary teacher that was really good exactly. at it. You exactly. Know, yeah. And having those resources is so important for their development. Element, we have to make it an attractive path for them to be able to, go and be able to go down and a feasible path from a financial perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard balance. I, I found as as someone who, who when I've mentioned to you before, I'm a, mod a moderate and it's a hard balance to think, you know, we want to have all of this, the, this social safety net. It's, it's hard to look at some of the European countries and say, look at all they have. Yet we want to protect our economy right. and our free enterprise, et cetera, and not necessarily turn into, you know, a different country, but somehow to reach a balance, which and in child care, that's a pretty big topic, as is clean water, because I mean, what, what, what are we going to, you know, without clean water, then what is, what are we? That's, I mean, that's a really big problem. So one of the yeah. things that I've seen over the course of the last four years, probably, is that these issues that we talked about today, mm. they do not fall to a political perspective mm. or no. through one political affiliation. Right. These transcend all of that kind of um, perception. So yeah. I want to focus on things that are impacting people. It's not about a political agenda. It's not about something that's being put down from the top. This is the stuff that I'm hearing on the doors, talking mm -hmm. to voters, identifying what's impacting their day-to-day -day lives. And that's going to be the focus of what I want to bring to the table in this role. Great. Well, Kevin, it's so nice to hear from you and to hear your passion and enthusiasm for for helping the community and being a community servant. <laughs> and I know as a resident of Norfolk that I have really appreciated 
being to reach out to you, you know, being able to reach out to you over the years you. Um, as you've been on the select board and, and knowing that you were a uh, friendly face and a willing lis willing listener. Yeah. Listening is one of your great qualities. Absolutely. That's how you get the best feedback in the <laughs> mm -hmm. world. No, you don't Listening. have to talk all the time. It's an Sometimes underrated it's characteristic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, that's a, excellent. Okay. Well, we're good. We, I think we have, um, we've covered everything. Any last, any last thoughts or are you? I'll just remind everybody that early in-person voting is currently ongoing. I'm not sure when this is going to be aired, but mm -hmm. um, Hopefully. early in-person voting for some towns will end on the 31st on Halloween. For other towns, mm -hmm. it will be uh, one more day on the 1st. Okay. Um, and then obviously election day is yep. going to be the 5th on Tuesday. The 5th. Yep. So if you haven't got your mail-in ballot in or dropped it off at mm -hmm. your local town clerk's office, if you haven't gotten it in for early in-person voting, we'll see you on November yeah, 5th at November the polls. 5th. Please make sure to yes. get out and vote. Please get out and vote. Yes. Um, I'm going to shake your hand. Thank you so much for coming of in. Of course. Yeah, Thank you so really much, Jill. Nice. Yeah, it was a really nice conversation. And on behalf of NCTV, I'm Jill Henley Lawrence. Thanks for watching.